Good morning to all. I want to thank you all for attending uh, today's important hearing uh, entitled Legislative Solutions. to make our nation's pipelines safer. <clears throat> and I want to welcome all of our witnesses <clears throat> that will be testifying, <clears throat> including some who are returning from our main oversight hearing. <clears throat> this morning we will be examining the Safer Pipelines Act of 2019, as well as H.R. 2139, the Lionel Rodman Pipeline Safety Act, introduced by our colleagues from Massachusetts, Mr. Trahan, Mr. Kennedy, and Mr. Mouton. Additionally, members may also inquire about provisions of the pipeline safety legislative proposal introduced earlier this month by FEMSA. In the beginning, I want to be crystal clear. The discussion draft introduced by the majority side represents many provisions that Chairman Pallone, myself, and other Democratic colleagues would ideally like to see included in pipeline safety reauthorization. However, as we have said time and time again, both Chairman Pallone and I would like for this process to be transparent, to be open, and we look forward to working with members of the minority FEMSA, and other important stakeholders to ultimately redraft legislation that will receive wider bipartisan support. I hope that I'm clear on this. We want to work with all uh, the stakeholders and also with the major uh, minority side. With that said, I would like to highlight some of the important provisions included in the discussion draft that I believe will make our nation's pipeline infrastructure safer and more secure. And one of the major components of the draft is that it will regulate many of the 435,000 miles of gathering lines, including all onshore pipelines operating above a specified pressure. I believe this is a common sense measure and that will help to inform and protect communities surrounding these gathering lines, which are completely un unregulated uh, in today's environment. The draft will also eliminate the quote, uh, grandfather clause, in the quote, so that pipelines built prior to July 1, 1970, will no longer be exempt from testing for their maximum allowable operating pressure, another common sense uh, provision. The bill will eliminate the nucleative cost-benefit requirements, which is currently on, only imposed on FEMSA and which is at least partly responsible for the agency missing so many of its deadlines for rulemaking, according to former Administrator Quarterman. The legislation also mandates automatic, automatic leak detection and shutoff valves for pipelines located in high consequence areas, a provision that should help to save vital time and potentially a uh, loss of life and property in the event of an accident. 
I believe that each of these provisions, as well as additional measures, will help bring additional resources and critical operational information to communities and to first responders. As both the subcommittee discussion draft and HR 2139 does, and would help to strengthen our nation's pipeline safety regime. I look forward to engaging uh, the witnesses and also the members of the minority and working with uh, all of you on uh, to enhance this legislation as we move uh, through the committee process. Uh, with that, I yield my time back and I recognize my good friend uh, from uh, the great state of Michigan, Ranking Member Upton, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing to continue our work on pipeline safety reauthorization. And uh, I look forward to your statement working with all of us uh, because I'm going to sound a little tough probably in my opening statement, but I know that we can do better than this discussion draft before us. Pipeline safety has always been one of my highest priorities in every Congress, and I was encouraged and optimistic that we could work on this bill together uh, as we have in the past. In fact, if you look back at the history, I believe that when we passed previous reauthorizations, they passed under suspension almost uh, always with more than 400 votes, if not by voice. But up until now, we on this side of the aisle have been pretty much left out of that drafting process. The discussion draft before us reflects that. In many respects, it appears that it will be more of a messaging bill than one that can truly advance safety practices and make it through the process and to the president to be signed before the end of September. And to be frank, this bill I don't think has a ghost of a chance of going anywhere in the Senate, you know, let alone getting signed by the president in the way, that shape, and form that it is now. So I know, I do know, that we all share many of the same priorities when it comes to pipeline safety, and we have worked together. And this is demonstrated by the strong bipartisan work that the committee produced the last time we reauthorized PHMSA and enacted real pipeline safety reforms. We need to continue on those bipartisan practices. So I urge you today to hit the button reset. Let's open the process up. Let's work together across the aisle rather than rushing this draft through the subcommittee. Let's give PHMSA an opportunity to testify on their reauthorization proposal and provide us with the technical assistance on the drafting. So far, they've not done so. We owe it to our constituents to have a more open and transparent process where all of the relevant stakeholders, particularly FIMSA, when they could have an opportunity to present their views on their reform proposals. One, I believe that we got to make sure that FIMSA and the states have the resources and the tools that they need to perform their pipeline safety responsibilities. Second, we need to hold FIMSA's feet to the fire, accountable for completing the outstanding congressional mandates and finishing the pending rulemakings left over from prior reauthorizations, absolutely. And third, we need to make sure that FIMSA, state regulators, and pipeline operators are incorporating lessons learned from prior accidents, integrating new technologies, and continue to improve on safety. I'm afraid that this draft falls short in several critical areas. For one, it appears that the draft could slow the pace of PHMSA's rulemaking by encouraging frivolous lawsuits that result in sue and settle agreements, potentially diverting agency resources from developing important safety regulations. It could also lengthen the interagency review process by having PHMSA and OMB incomplete rulemakings that fail to consider the full range of costs and benefits. This draft may also have the unintended effect of weakening pipeline safety. Not a good thing. Particularly concerned that the draft would arbitrarily mandate certain technologies such as automatic valves on liquid pipelines, which could lead to accidental pipeline ruptures when that liquid backs up. This draft could also prohibit direct assessment of pipelines, which is a valuable method for evaluating and managing corrosion threats. The discussion draft may also divert PHMSA's limited resources by, expa by expanding its jurisdiction to include regulation of gathering lines, which are effectively managed at the state level today. Finally, 
I'm concerned that the draft does nothing to encourage innovation or the adoption of new pipeline safety technologies or safety processes. It also fails to incentivize pipeline operators to voluntarily exceed minimum safety requirements. I don't think that the draft goes far enough to, pre to prevent cyber attacks, something we've all been worried about, and discourage back bad actors from damaging pipeline facilities. So as we move forward, I plan to keep an open mind, especially given our history with pipeline safety and our good, working, excellent relationship. But if we hit recess and take, excuse me, if we hit reset and take our time on this, rather than speeding ahead to subcommittee markup next week, I think we'll have a much better bill than what's before us today. And with that, I yield back. I thought you were my friend. Yes, <laughs> my buddy. <laughs> the chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Malone, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing focuses on two legislative proposals to improve pipeline safety in America. In May, the subcommittee held an oversight hearing to hear from stakeholders about what changes are needed as we consider reauthorization of the Pipeline Safety Act. Since we last reauthorized this critical federal program three years ago this week, several major pipeline incidents have occurred, underscoring the need for additional reforms to our federal pipeline safety programs. Last year, a failure in Massachusetts' Merrimack Valley killed one person, injured 21 others, and damaged more than 130 homes. We've made progress on federal pipeline safety over the last 20 years since the Olympic gas line pipeline explosion in Bellingham, Washington killed three young people. But preventable incidents still occur, and we must do everything in our power to ensure our national pipeline network is as safe as possible. The Safer Pipelines Act of 2019, a discussion draft the subcommittee will review today, makes several critical changes to the federal pipeline safety program. A major overarching problem with the federal pipeline safety program is that it takes the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, FIMSA, too long to finalize congressional mandates. There are still outstanding rulemakings that were required in 2011 and 2016 reauthorizations that PHMSA has failed to finish, and this is unacceptable. At our oversight hearing in May, we heard that the biggest cause for delay is the prescriptive cost-benefit analysis required by the 1996 reauthorization. The discussion draft removes this duplicative requirement while still ensuring PHMSA rules are subject to the same economic analysis that every other major rule receives. The proposal also restores the mechanism for citizens to pursue legal action to compel FIMSA to fulfill its statutory duties, which was a major issue in the aftermath of the 2010 San Bruno pipeline explosion that killed eight people in Northern California. San Francisco sued the federal government for having objectively failed to enforce safely safety standards, but the suit was dismissed because the court held that the law did not permit mandamus-type citizen suits. Another critical area addressed in the discussion draft is the need for modifying the ridiculously high bar for imposing criminal penalties in current law. The proposal changes the standard to knowingly or recklessly, which would bring the pipeline criminal standard in line with that of, hazmat, of a hazmat statute. The government must be able to hold companies accountable when they knowingly or recklessly ignore the law. The Trump administration has submitted its own reauthorization proposal, which includes a provision to criminalize pipeline construction protests. I have no intention of allowing a pipeline safety bill to be used as a vehicle for stifling legitimate dissent and protests. That provision is dead on arrival as far as I'm concerned. There are, however, a number of useful ideas within the administration's proposal, and I look forward to working with my colleagues and the Department of Transportation to find common ground on these issues. The subcommittee will also review the Lionel Randon Pipeline Safety Act introduced by Representatives Trahan Kennedy and Moulton. This bill is a direct response to the failures that occurred during the Merrimack Valley incident in Massachusetts, and it would improve the management of gas pipeline distribution systems and fix gaps in safety regulations that led to the tragedy in Massachusetts. I commend the bill's sponsors for their thoughtful effort, and I'm hopeful we can include several ideas from their proposal in a final pipeline safety reauthorization bill. The ideas included in the Safer Pipelines Act are important to me and to communities around the country. 
But this is a draft and serves as a starting point for discussion and collaboration, just as this hearing is a means to get all ideas for reauthorization out into the open and onto the table. So I look forward to hearing from my committee colleagues on both sides of the aisle today on their ideas for reauthorization, because I hope and expect that the final product that committee reports will be a strong bipartisan bill, and I'm committed to working in a bipartisan manner to update and improve this critical federal program so that we can produce a final bill that we can all be proud of and obviously gets passed in the Senate and signed by the President. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. <clears throat> Gentlemen, you expect the Chair uh, now recognizes Mr. Flores, who's going to read the statement of the ranking member, Mr. Walden. Uh, Mr. Flores, Flores, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The committee's work to reauthorize and modernize the nation's pipeline safety program is important and deserves close, careful, and bipartisan attention. This is the hallmark of this committee's work, especially when it comes to safety-related legislation. While it looked like that we were on the right track a month ago, we haven't made much progress since then. In part, I think this is because we have not been adhering completely to our past bipartisan practices. Judging by the discussion draft before us today, it appears that the Democrats have chosen to go it along up until this point, releasing a partisan draft, and that, on our initial read, it requires a lot of work. Mr. Chairman, members deserve the ability to gather the views of all relevant stakeholders and to understand the full impact of legislation before voting on it. The discussion draft before us today was only released last week, and the process was so rushed that, as I understand it, FEMSA didn't have time to prepare testimony. While we were fortunate to have FEMSA testify back in May, it has come to my attention that our members' questions for the record still have not been submitted. This is over six weeks later. So here we are today with many unanswered questions for FEMSA and facing the prospect of a subcommittee markup next week. Mr. Chairman, as you know, pipeline safety reauthorization has historically been a fully bipartisan process. Under the Republican majority, Democrats and Republicans sat down together to work through the issues and to draft a bill. I'm disappointed that more than a month has gone by and we still have nothing to show for it. As we move ahead, I hope that we can, can get a commitment to slow down and work together. While we may not agree on everything, I believe that there are many areas where we can strengthen the law to drive innovation and to improve safety. First and foremost, we should recognize that pipeline safety is a shared responsibility between FEMS of the states and pipeline operators. There's a lot that Congress can do to encourage pipeline operators to improve their performance, However, I have serious concerns over the discussions draft, one-size-fits-all approach, and overly prescriptive mandates. This administration inherited a number of missed deadlines for pipeline safety rulemakings from the prior administration. However, FEMSA officials have worked hard and have made substantial progress in this regard. Certain impacts from this discussion draft actually could delay these important rulemakers to improve safety and to bog down the process even further. This does not serve the public interest. While it can be tempting, we should not get too far ahead of ourselves. Congress should recognize and account for the safety improvements that will be implemented, implemented through the outstanding congressional mandates and the pending rulemakings. FEMSA is making progress on several important regulations addressing hazardous liquid pipelines, gas pipelines, valve and rupture protection, and plastic pipes, among other regulatory actions. Together, these rules represent many years of work, and we should not pull out the rug and disrupt the prog progress by injecting more regulatory uncertainty. Our reauthorization bill should reflect this reality by continuing to encourage a cooperative, flexible approach to pipeline safety. We should make sure the FEMSA and the states have adequate resources to inspect and protect the nation's pipeline system. We should hold FEMSA accountable for completing overdue rulemakings. And finally, we should encourage pipeline operators to adopt new technologies and to, and to continue to improve safety. With this, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing, and I look forward to the testimony of the witnesses. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The Chairman would like to remind members that, pursuant to committee rules, all members' written opening statements shall be made part of the record. I would like to now introduce a panel of witnesses for today's hearing. On my left is Ms. Uh, Mrs. Christina Sames, uh, the Vice President of Operations and Engineering of the American Gas Association. Next to her is Mr. Chuck Lesniak, the Principal of CO3 Consulting on behalf of the Pipeline Safety Trust. Uh, next to Mr. Lesniak 
is Mr. Andrew Black. Mr. Black is the president and CEO of the Association of Oil Pipelines. And last but not least is Mr. Christopher C.J. Osmond. He's the director of operations, safety, and integrity of the, for the Interstate National Gas Association of America. We want to thank uh, all of our witnesses for joining us today, and we look forward to your testimony. At this time, uh, the chair would like will now recognize each um, witness for five minutes to provide their opening statement. But let me caution you before we begin. I want to explain this lighting system. There is a system here now. In front of you is a series of lights. The light will initially be green at the start of your opening statement. The light will turn yellow <laughs> when you have one minute remaining. And please begin to wrap up your statement uh, at that point. The light will, return, will turn red when your time expires. If you continue, then we'll put you over in the corner and with a nuts cap on. <laughs> Mr. Sames, Ms. Sames, you are now recognized for five minutes uh, for the purposes of an opening statement. And I don't want to be put in the corner, so Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton, and members of the subcommittee, I'm Christina Sames, Vice President of Operations and Engineering at the American Gas Association. Prior to AGA, I worked at Pipeline Research Council International and spent 12 years at PHMSA where I worked to advance pipeline safety initiatives. AGA represents more than 200 local energy companies that deliver natural gas to 74 million customers. The gas utilities distribution pipelines are the final link in the delivery chain that brings natural gas from the wellhead to the burner tip. AGA member employees live in the communities that they serve, interact daily with the customers and state regulators who oversee pipeline safety locally. Safety is the very core of AGA and its members, and we go well beyond regulations to improve pipeline safety. We take pride in the overall safety performance, but recent incidents are a painful reminder we must continue to raise the bar in safety. Any incident is one incident too many. The industry is supportive of flexible, risk-based, and practical improvements to pipeline safety that reflect lessons learned from past pipeline incidents. There's little in the House Energy and Commerce Bill that accomplishes that particular goal. For example, the proposed legislation removes the requirement that regulations be reasonable or cost-effective. The cost-benefit analysis was mandated to ensure that regulations do not put an undue burden on customers that bear the cost of mandates without a measurable improvement to the safe delivery of natural gas. That's logical and should continue as the criteria for developing regulations. There are other provisions in the Energy and Commerce Bill and Market Train Bill that do not appear to improve pipeline safety. For example, deliver, eliminating the use of direct assessment, a tool that not only determines the corrosion has occurred, but it is predictive and indicates where corrosion could occur. Um, that should be allowed to be continued. Requiring operators to send integrity management plans, operation and maintenance manuals, pipeline characteristics, and many other documents to emergency responders. In my discussions over the years with first responders, their concerns have centered around getting way too much information that sits on the shelf. They want condensed, meaningful, and understandable information. Increasing civil penalties, expanding criminal liability to include recklessness, and adding a provision that, include, that encourages litigation against FEMSA will do little to improve pipeline safety. Core to a strong safety culture is encouraging self-disclosure within a company and with the regulators. A more productive alternative would be to encourage voluntary sharing of safety issues as proposed by the administration bill. AG is supportive of actually many of the provisions in the administration's bill, including the safety incentives program that encourages companies to exceed regulations, pipeline safety pilot programs for technology advances, and criminal penalties for those that damage, destroy, vandalize, or otherwise disrupt operation and create pipeline safety issues. During the pipeline safety reauthorization process, AG asked the subcommittee to consider four high-level priorities. One, preserve industry's engagement 
in pipeline safety rulemaking by upholding PHMSA's regulatory process. Two, provide support, flexibility, and regulations by recognizing that gas distribution systems differ and avoid one-size-fits-all prescriptive regulations. Three, don't obstruct pipeline safety replacement programs at the state level via new mandates that delay replacements or require replacements faster than work can be accomplished safely, reliably, and without compromising quality. And four, focus on provisions that improve pipeline safety by, avoid, by avoiding extraneous legal, regulatory, and administrative provisions that really hamper the regulatory process. Our full statement covers a number of pipeline safety reauthorization topics. I would like to reiterate industry's commitment to safety, public safety, worker safety, and pipeline safety are all core values that affect everything that we do and how we do it. We know that without safety, nothing else matters. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this hearing, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Lisniak for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to speak about pipeline safety today. Before we get into various pipeline safety issues, let me give you a brief overview of where we stand today regarding the safety of pipelines in this country. According to FEMSA data, over the past five years, there's been an, on average nearly two reportable pipeline incidents every day that cause the death or hospitalization of over seven people every month. These incidents have caused nearly $2.4 billion in property damage and released over 18 million gallons of hazardous liquids into the environment. While progress has been made over the last 20 years and pipelines are a critical part of our nation's energy infrastructure, pipelines are near our homes, schools, shopping centers, lakes, rivers, and coastlines, and we simply must do better to protect our communities and the environment. We thank the committee for releasing a strong bill for discussion as part of this year's reauthorization process. And we also thank and recognize the members from Massachusetts for their efforts to introduce good legislation to address the tragedy that occurred in the Merrimack Valley last year. We support the vast majority of the provisions in these bills. We certainly support the parts of these bills that make it easier to pass needed regulations and to meaningfully enforce those regulations. This would include Section 4 of this committee's bill to correct the unnecessary duplication of cost-benefit requirements in the statute, Sections 8 and 9 making both the civil and cr criminal pen penalties more meaningful, and Section 7 that helps to align these statutes with many others, allowing citizens to petition the courts when FEMSA fails in its duty to carry out congressional mandates. It has long been understood that part of the pipeline safety problem in this country is that FEMSA and its state regulatory partners are often underfunded for the task at hand. We thank Congress for their previous support to expand the number of FEMSA inspectors, and we strongly support the level of appropriations in this committee's draft bill to support the needed increases to the reimbursement rates for state programs, allow FEMSA to better conduct data and risk analysis, their special program implementation, and for enforcement and regulatory efforts. As the Trust has pointed out for over a decade, according to FEMSA, there are over 435,000 miles of unregulated natural gas gathering lines in this country many of which are functionally the same as gas transmission pipelines and present similar hazards to the public and the environment. We strongly support the change in definitions in se Section 3 that would bring the higher pressure gathering lines under some form of federal minimum standards. We also believe that it's very important that the location of these lines be known to regulators, emergency responders, and surrounding communities, so we also hope you will amend Section 60132 of the statute to remove the harmful clause that exempts these pipelines from being included in the National Pipeline Mapping System. We really appreciate the provision of this committee's bill in the Leonel Rondon Pipeline Safety Act that proposes to make clear in the statute what FEMSA has failed to make clear in their regulations. For well over 20 years, the NTSB, Congress, and others have tried to get FEMSA to implement meaningful rules regarding leak detection and automated valves. We support Section 5's effort to make this clear by adding it directly to the statute. We also suggest that it be made clear that FEMSA must adopt a clear standard for effectiveness for any new rules regarding leak detection. We support Section 2, 3, 4, and 6 of the Lionel Rondon Pipeline Safety Act, which clarifies important lessons unfortunately learned through the Merrimack Valley tragedy. We continue here to hear complaints from local emergency responders about the difficulty in obtaining meaningful information about the pipelines that run through their communities. 
We support Section 6 of your bill that will go a long way to alleviating this problem and ask that you ensure it includes the information that NTSB has recommended be provided to emergency responders. The administration has also recent, recently released the Protecting Our Infrastructure of Pipelines and Enhancing Safety Act of 2019. While it's a substantially weaker bill than what this committee has drafted, there are many good provisions in it that we support, some of which are correctly aimed at fixing issues learned in the Merrimack Valley tragedy. There are also some troubling sections that in, in the administration's bill that we hope you will not adopt. Please see our written testimony for specifics. I see my time is almost up, and so thank you again for inviting me to testify today. I'm glad to answer any questions. And the chair now recognizes Mr. Blank for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. I'm Andy Black, President and CEO of the Association of Oil Pipelines. AOPL represents owners and operators of pipelines transporting crude oil, refined petroleum products like gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and home heating oil, and industrial products like propane and ethane. Pipeline safety reauthorization legislation offers us an opportunity to continue improvements in pipeline safety. We all seek safer pipelines as the subcommittee's discussion draft title calls for. Reauthorization should be a place where we can collaborate work on proposals that bring stakeholders together and protect each other from harm. Unfortunately, the discussion draft misses some opportunities for a shared path of collaboration and eliminates other opportunities in the law today. Instead, the liquid pipeline industry asks that we move forward with positive solutions to harness the benefits of innovation and technology to improve pipeline safety, bring stakeholders together to improve FEMSA programs and regulations, and protect the public environment from harm. Technology and innovation offer opportunities to move pipeline safety forward. High-tech inspection tools can now scan pipelines like an MRI or an ultrasound at the doctor's office. And yet, crucial sessions of PHMSA's inspection and maintenance regulations are nearly 20 years old and have gaps that fail to address problems like cracking in pipelines. AOPL recommends a pilot program to provide PHMSA the data it needs to modernize and fill gaps in regulations. Improving how PHMSA performs its pipeline safety mission is important to liquid pipeline operators. The industry joined with PHMSA, state regulators, pipeline safety advocates, environmental advocates, and representatives of organized labor to recommend creation of a voluntary information sharing program. This collaborative program, modeled after a successful FAA program for the aviation industry and recommended by a past Congress, would empower pipeline safety stakeholders to jointly solve pipeline safety issues. Unfortunately, authorization for this program is not in the discussion draft. Instead, there are proposals that drive stakeholders apart and make it harder for PHMSA to improve pipeline safety. The discussion draft eliminates requirements for PHMSA to benefit from its technical advisory committees and takes away seats at the table for safety advocacy groups, environmental groups, and pipeline operators during the rulemaking process. The discussion draft would deprive the public of expert discussion of the costs and benefits of proposals. The discussion draft would even eliminate requirements that FEMSA consider whether its regulations would be reasonable. I can hardly imagine the subcommittee wants FEMSA to consider only proposals that would be unreasonable. A discussion draft proposal to add a criminal reckless standard would chill a core component of pipeline safety. Operators and assess and rank the risks of their pipeline systems and then perform preventative maintenance based on a prioritization of risk. Comprehensive risk management is at the heart of safety management systems that have been encouraged by the NTSB and PHMSA. Changing the standard to reckless would lead to second-guessing technical risk assessment decisions with the benefit of 2020 hindsight to make a case that an operator should have known that a risk would have caused an incident. Pipeline operators also may be discouraged from openly sharing information about incidents, a key component of our programs to improve safety industry-wide. Applying an ambiguous legal standard of recklessness by criminalizing pipeline risk assessment will not advance pipeline safety. A discussion draft provision to require automatic shutoff valves on liquids pipelines would actually hurt pipeline safety by creating the risk of quickly forcing closed pipeline valves in an uncontrolled way, as the ranking member said, leading to a pressure surge and possible pipeline rupture. GAO studied this at the request of Congress and confirmed several cases in the past where similar conditions led to ruptures and releases of gasoline and crude oil. Finally, 
The pipeline industry believes it is important to protect the surrounding public and the environment from attacks on pipelines. There are loopholes to close in federal law that prevent enforcement against dangerous valve-turning activity condemned by pipeline safety advocates as well as the industry. We commend FEMSA for putting forward a proposal to protect the pipeline, to protect the public and the environment from attacks. Yesterday, organized labor through the International Union of Organized Engineers, the Laborers International Union of North America, North America's Building Trade Unions, and the United Association of Plumbers and Pipefitters added their support for this effort, writing, for the safety of American families, the environment, and the skilled trade workers dedicated to safely building and maintaining our infrastructure, Congress should prioritize closing those loopholes in federal law. We hope to work with this subcommittee on tailored legislation to address this safety priority. I hope we can come together around these proposals for greater stakeholder collaboration, greater use of new technologies and innovation, and greater ways to improve FEMSA programs and protect the public from harm. Thank you. The Chair, thanks the gentleman. The Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Osman. Osman? Osman. Osman for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Walden, Ranking Member Upton, members of the subcommittee. Good morning. My name is C.J. Osman, and I'm the Director of Operations, Safety, and Integrity at the Interstate Natural Gas Association of America, INGA. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. INGA appreciates the important work that the subcommittee is undertaking, and we look forward to working with you on a reauthorization bill that enhances pipeline safety in America. INGA's members transport natural gas through a network of transmission pipelines that are analogous to the interstate highway system. These are large capacity, critical infrastructure systems that span multiple states or regions to bring our nation's natural gas to market. That natural gas is used to heat our homes, to cook our food, to power our nation's industries, and to generate electricity. Our industry is relentlessly committed to its obligation to the communities we serve to operate safely, reliably, and responsibly. INGA asked the subcommittee to consider four key points in its deliberations to reauthorize the Pipeline Safety Act. First, INGA strongly supports updating the act to reflect modern pipeline safety technologies and engineering practices. Many FIMSA regulations are outdated, which can create a barrier to implementing 21st century programs. Therefore, INGA supports FIMSA's legislative proposals to implement a new technology pilot program and to require timely incorporation of consensus technical standards by reference. Additionally, Congress should direct FIMSA to complete its ongoing rulemaking to update the 50-year-old class location change regulations. Second, Congress should embrace the recommendations of FIMSA's advisory committees when updating the Pipeline Safety Act. The Gas Pipeline Advisory Committee provides technical and policy input on FIMSA's natural gas rulemakings. The advisory committee is comprised of equal representation from members of the public, federal and state agencies, and natural gas operators. INGA is concerned that the subcommittee's proposed changes to the maximum allowable operating pressure and direct assessment requirements contradict FIMSA's pending gas transmission safety rules and would overrule years of advisory committee discussions. For example, while spike testing is an important tool, it is an aggressive technique that is not relevant to confirming maximum allowable operating pressure. If enacted, the broad application of spike testing proposed in the subcommittee's discussion draft would risk damaging our nation's natural gas infrastructure and not make it safer. Additionally, professional engineer licenses are not necessary for all pipeline engineers. Different tasks require different knowledge, training, and skills. Instead of a restrictive licensure requirement, INGA supports the comprehensive management of change requirement in FIMS's pending gas transmission rules. This approach will more effectively ensure a competent technical review. Furthermore, instead of issuing a self-executing mandate directing operators to make more information available to the public and to first responders, Congress should leverage the expertise of FIMSA and the diversity of the agency's advisory committees to evaluate this issue. Third, INGA urges the subcommittee to retain important aspects of the FIMSA rulemaking process. Congress should retain the cost-benefit analysis requirement in the Pipeline Safety Act. This requirement ensures that FIMSA evaluates available alternatives to identify the best option when developing new regulations, and it requires a transparent public review of FIMSA's analysis. No FIMSA regulation has ever been overturned on the basis of the cost-benefit analysis requirement, demonstrating that the Act currently provides a clear, legally defensible standard. Additionally, adding a mandamus provision to allow citizens to sue FIMSA would not enhance pipeline safety. <coughs> FIMSA is best positioned to make decisions regarding how to regulate pipelines, and Congress has sufficient oversight tools to require the agency to meet its statutory obligations. 
Inga shares the subcommittee's frustration over FIMS's delays in completing new rulemakings. But rather than bypassing the rulemaking process through self-executing mandates or mandamus, Congress should strengthen FIMS's rulemaking capabilities. Therefore, we strongly support solutions such as the subcommittee's direct hire proposal. Fourth, several of the proposals would make unnecessary or harmful changes to the enforcement provisions in the Pipeline Safety Act. This would encourage litigation and non-disclosure at the expense of collaboration and safety culture. There is no need to modify the existing criminal provision for operator violations. Federal prosecutors have successfully brought criminal cases against pipeline operators where appropriate, and there is no evidence that the current statutory language has created a bar to criminal prosecution. Furthermore, FIMS's civil penalty authority is not lacking. The current limits exceed those in many other health, safety, and environmental protection statutes. In addition to fines, FIMSA issues corrective action orders, which can produce immediate safety benefits. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Inga stands ready to support a timely reauthorization bill that enhances the safety of our nation's pipeline infrastructure. The chair, I thank all the witnesses for their statements, uh, opening statements. We have now concluded uh, opening statements, and we will now move toward member questioning. Uh, members uh, will have five minutes to ask questions of our witnesses. And I will start uh, this process by recognizing myself for five minutes. <clears throat> Mr. Lizak, uh in your testimony, you know that currently Section 60132 uh, exempts gathering lines from the a national pipeline mapping system, meaning that there's no way to know exactly where these lines are actually located. Can you discuss uh, with us the main differences between transmission lines, which are regulated, and gathering lines, which are not? Uh, do gathering lines pose a similar public safety risk as transmission line, uh, and if so, does the language in, in the discussion draft help address uh, this issue, or is there additional language needed to both regulate these lines and make them a part of the mapping system? Thank you for that question. Um, I, I spent a good part of my career with the city of Austin as an emergency responder. And these gathering lines, many of them are indistinguishable from gas transmission pipelines. And they ought to be, the, at least the location and basic information about these lines ought to be available to local governments, um, local emergency responders, and the general public. Um, to me, that makes no sense that I can go online using the National pa Pipeline Mapping System and find out where gas transmission lines are in my community and uh, emergency responders can do the exact same thing so that they can be prepared to respond to those kind of incidents on those pipelines. But a gathering line with the exact same type of characteristics, that information is not available to local emergency responders. And, and so, so the answer is yes. I, I think that that's a critical uh, uh, piece of the proposed bill and is critical to keeping our community safe. Um, jump to uh, the issue of uh, workforce issues at SIMSA. Uh, specifically, does SIMSA have the sufficient number of professional staff with the right expertise to handle all the, all of the responsibilities that fall under the agency's jurisdiction, including conducting a pipeline inspections and finalizing its rulemaking? Uh, Again, does the discussion draft help address this issue? And are there other provisions that we should consider adding to this bill? You know, in my opinion, I think FEMSA is chronically underfunded and understaffed. They compete with the industry um, with, uh, for expertise um, and struggle with keeping that expertise within the agency as they develop ex experts. And so I think the direct hire provision in the discussion draft um, is very helpful for that. Um, I think that uh, uh, many of the stakeholders uh, 
industry and pipeline safety advocates share that concern about FEMSA staffing. And anything that uh, Congress can do um, to facilitate um, hiring and retention of uh, critical staff for FEMSA is, is a good thing, and, and this bill um, goes uh, in that direction. Uh, again, Mr. Lisiang, Section 6 of the discussion draft entitled Community Right to Know and Emergency Preparedness is designed to make critical operational information available to local communities and to first responders. Additionally, uh, Mr. Lisiang, Section 6 of H.R. 2139 uh, requires the production and maintenance of complete up-to-date records of distribution systems and the requirement that these records be available to the relevant regulators. While these provisions uh, would strengthen the engagement of pipeline operators with local emergency planning committees and local first responders, while also providing the public with frequently requested information, why are these so critical to both uh, safety reasons and uh, building the public trust? And, and again, as based on my career as a first responder, uh, you know, I was surprised when I got involved in, in pipeline issues how difficult it was to get really critical technical information about pipelines in our community. Um, it really is dependent on the operator of that pipeline, and you've got operators that are uh, much more open about sharing technical information about their pipelines, and you've got operators that just refuse to provide essentially any information at all that they're not required to provide by statute. And so anything that, that Congress can do to level that playing field so that local re first responders can get that information about the pipelines in their community is, is critical, because one of the things that I've found working with the uh, Austin, Texas Fire Department, is they know very little about the pipelines in their community. Um, the pipeline auto operators historically in our community provide just the very basic awareness information, and if an incident were to happen in our community, I think that our first responders would be woefully unprepared, and that information ought to be provided to them um, on a routine basis. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, the ranking member, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I do have a lot of questions, and I'm going to try to keep my questions brief, and hopefully your answers will be brief so I can go through them, but I am going to formally draft these up as a letter to each of you for, for you to formally respond, and if you can do that as quickly as you can, knowing that we're on somewhat of a, a timetable here, that would be uh, good. Mr. Osmond, you made a good point in your testimony about the draft legislation's removal of the cost-benefit analysis and inclusion of and animus, uh, civil suits uh, speeding up the pace of FIMS's uh, rulemaking. I appreciate that. Does, in your opinion, does the draft legislation encourage collaboration among pipeline safety stakeholders and advisory committees during consideration of any new regulations? N no, not as much as it could. And Ms. Sames, Ms. Sames, does the draft legislation prefer preserve effective state pipeline replacement and upgrade programs? I say that because we replaced a pipeline a number of years ago in Michigan, uh, and, uh, which was a good thing, and the, the old pipeline was, was left in place, but uh, how does this draft legislation impact something like that? It doesn't address it. Uh, Mr. Black, does the draft legislation authorize FEMSA to allow operators to incorporate new safety technologies or best practices that may not be addressed in the regulations? No. And does the draft legislation address the safety of, of inactive pipelines at all or no. not? Does the draft legislation incentivize the timely updating of regs to incorporate the latest industry standards? No, and wish it would. And uh, can you provide us maybe with some uh, uh, constructive language? And does the draft legislation discourage folks from attacking pipeline facilities, something I think a lot of us are concerned about? No, and we wish it would. And uh, what does the draft do on cybersecurity? It doesn't have any provisions on cybersecurity. Um, does the draft legislation preserve and support the years of ongoing work to update both gas and liquid pipeline regulations? Not directly, no. Mr. Osmond, you have a comment on that too? 
Now it contradicts it and undoes it. So what does it do to encourage pipeline operators to share information about the lessons learned? I mean, that's one of the things that prompted us years ago uh, to look at pipeline accidents. What, what happened? Uh, I've had some pipelines break not too far from my district, but in some also we had a gas pipeline that broke, a gas pipeline that broke in my district and, you know, careful effort was made to, to uh, uh, test forensically, in fact, what exactly happened so that improvements could be made so that we wouldn't have an issue uh, later on in, in any community. This particular incident in my home county was, uh, was, thank goodness, it was in a potato farm, so there was nobody around, but they were able to get the evidence uh, from that break and, and uh, uh, be able to make some rec recommendations. But uh, to me, that's something that ought to be shared from experiences that were made or from, from happenings that occurred. If the subcommittee were to authorize a voluntary information sharing program, it would encourage discussion of incident lessons. And if the subcommittee moves forward with their criminal reckless standard, it, it discourages that open sharing across companies. Yeah. Um, does the draft legislation incentivize operators to adopt best practices or exceed minimum federal safety standards? No, and we would encourage the administration provision that calls for timely incorporation for reference. Have, have any of you looked at, I, I believe PHMSA actually had a proposal um, that we've not looked at formally, that we've not had a yes, hearing on, they're, they're not the here to testify today. Bill calling for regular timely incorporation uh, into uh, regulations mm -hmm. of best practice. So one of my questions will be that, that I provide in writing is, could you, each of you in organizations take a look at that PHMSA proposal and make recommendations as this is a good thing, this is a bad thing, this is how you might might alter that? Is that okay? Yes. Mr. Lesniak, I didn't, is that okay? Yes, we'd be happy to do so. Uh, great. Well, um, I look forward to working with all of you. It's a, this is a really important issue. Uh, we have millions of miles of pipelines, and we can always do better. And we need to learn from those uh, mistakes and work together in a, in a way to ensure that um, the operators and our communities, in fact, are safe. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I look forward to working with you as this issue moves forward. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Doyle for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, welcome to our panelists today. I appreciate the opportunity to consider legislation related to pipeline safety. Pennsylvania is in the midst of a natural gas boom, which is a tremendous resource, but only if it's developed in a way that protects human health and the environment. In Pennsylvania, fracking is often very close to or within communities, and pipelines run through neighborhoods and high-density areas, so I take this issue very seriously, and I look forward to examining the ways to strengthen current regulations and protections. Uh, the natural gas industry has grown rapidly in Pennsylvania in recent years, while FIMSA funding for states have not kept pace. Uh, Ms. Sames, uh, Mr. Lesiak, or Mr. Black, uh, do you believe that the states have sufficient resources to support enforcement and oversight of pipelines under their jurisdiction, such as interest, intrastate pipelines and the siting of hazardous liquid pipelines? And maybe you could just go down very quickly and answer that. Mm -hmm. AJ has always been supportive of more resources for the states. Uh, yes, uh, Pipeline Safety Trust agrees that the, the states are un, underfunded. States should have the resources they need. So, Mr. Lesniak, you, you mentioned in your testimony the importance of additional funding for states to close the gap between the amount that FIMSA is allowed to fund state pipeline safety programs and the amount that they actually do. Can you elaborate on that? We've got more in our written testimony and we can uh, be happy to get you more written, more detailed information on that. I, I do think it's a critical issue, especially in states like Pennsylvania, Texas, other states that have seen rapid growth in uh, 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 oil and gas exploration and uh, production. And we're seeing uh, a huge boom in, in pipeline construction, and it's clearly outpaced the, the abilities of states to keep up with it. Pennsylvania's natural gas infrastructure dates back to the 19th century, so aging infrastructure is a concern for our region also. 
Uh, Ms. Sames, in your testimony, you described the progress that's been made in replacing cast iron pipe with plastic piping for distribution, main, and service lines. How are, how are your members prioritizing the location for service upgrades, and does this consider aspects such as terrain and the risk of mine subsidence, as is the case in a lot of southwestern Pennsylvania? It, it covers all of that. Uh, so when you're doing replacement programs, you're looking at a number of factors. You're looking at the materials, the age, the construction techniques, the environment that the pipeline is in, the, the environment around the pipeline, and what you're learning through leak surveys. Um, so for things like cast iron, you want to replace the smaller lines first because those historically are the ones that are mo more fragile to breaking. Um, where you're getting larger pipelines that you've had absolutely no issues, um, maybe you prioritize those a little bit later because they seem to be functioning really well. But ground movement is something that will cause an additional risk on cast iron. So you want to get rid of cast iron where there are where there are ground movements like coal subsidence. So yes, it's all taken into account. Thank you. Um, I co-sponsored legislation with my colleague, Mr. Olson, to address a shortage of qualified staff at FERC. So I'm glad to see language included in the Pallone bill to address the similar staffing issue at PHMSA. Uh, can anyone please speak to the staffing needs at PHMSA, and do you think that PHMSA would be able to adequately address this issue without additional authority and funding? Maybe Mr. Lesiak, what do you think? Um, we can certainly provide you more information on that, but as, as I think we've all mentioned, FEMSA is chronically understaffed and they, have, they struggle with targeting priority areas. Let me ask you also, uh, what are your views on the process of siting hazardous pipelines? Do you think FEMSA should have a role in this process? Ab absolutely, they, they should have a role. Um, safety is not addressed during the siting process. The agencies will tell you um, that are involved in siting that it's not referenced in the, in the regulations, and that uh, PHMSA today voluntarily uh, participates in, in the siting process for many pipelines, but I think it should be clearly addressed in the statute so that it's a clear responsibility for PHMSA. What about you, Mr. Black? What do you think? PHMSA has a comprehensive series of construction codes that affect pipeline regulation, pipeline construction, excuse me. They're there watching pipeline construction. Any pipeline that uh, is going to go into service must pass a hydrostatic pressure test before it begins operation. And PHMSA always has the authority to shut a pipeline down if it believes it's safe. We believe there's no gap here. PHMSA has a clear role in safe operation of pipelines, including construction. I see my time's up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Ronan, uh, the ranking member is recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Thanks for having this hearing. Thanks to our witnesses for your uh, testimony, which informs our work. I have to confess I'm a little disappointed we're, we're moving ahead with a legislative hearing when we don't have FIMSA here today. I think we will benefit from their uh, response to our QFRs from the prior hearing and when they can actually be here. Um, and so I hope we're not going to rush into a markup uh, without thoroughly vetting and making significant improvements to this draft. And I think you all have weighed in in, in areas you think it can be approved upon. And so we want to get this right. We believe in pipeline safety. Um, and it needs to be a bipartisan effort as it always has been. So I want to focus on a, a couple of things that draft legislation uh, uh, deals with. And so to each of you, I've got a couple of questions. What are we doing to encourage pipeline operators to continue innovating and incorporating the most cost, uh, or the most cutting edge technologies and best practices? Are our regulations keeping pace? Pretty broad question, but Mr. Black? I'll take it. The regulations are not keeping pace with innovation. FEMSA is slow. We've encouraged the committee to authorize a pilot program modeled after what they have for motor carrier. The administration supported this. This would let them road test new technologies and approaches and update their regulations more frequently. Very Do each important. of you agree with that statement? Uh, I definitely agree. Um, w w the process now when new technology comes out, there is typically a pretty long delay where it has to be pilot tested States need to weigh in. Um, it all hampers technology advancements quickly. Um, so anything that can be done to advance that, uh, the administration bill does has been information on a pilot on new technology. I know I'm supportive of it. We want to get technology out faster. All right. Mr. Lesniak. 
Um, we do have some questions about a potential pilot program. We're, we're in favor of uh, bringing in technology that makes pipelines safer, safer but as, if we're going to put stuff in the ground, we want to make sure that it's safe before it gets put in the ground. Yeah, sure. Mr. Osby? Absolutely. We, you know, we agree with Thims's proposal uh, for the pilot program. I think um, we need Congress's help to fill in a gap in the process right now to test those technologies that look like they're ready, but we don't know for sure until we can implement right. them in the real world. So we're very supportive of that proposal. It's everybody's benefit. Mm -hmm. um, I also believe we should consider the voluntary program uh, to promote sharing of information and lessons learned across the industry. And I know some of you have referenced that. Do you all agree that that's a good way to go here? And lessons learned, voluntary program. Uh, AGA definitely does. Um, we do a lot of sharing behind the scenes among operators. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to share more with the regulators, but we need a safe harbor in order to do that. Um, we see most of it in some of the provisions. It's still lacking a few areas. Okay. Mr. Lesniak. Uh, we do think that the VIS program um, has, has uh, potential. We want to make sure that it's not a substitute for withholding specific information about specific pipelines and incidents. Got it. Months Black. have been spent on this on a, with a group convened by PHMSA of a broad collection of stakeholders. They've come up with a report from that committee on a proposal for Congress in a way to get operators to participate in that. We urge the committee to adopt that. All right, Mr. Osmond. I'll just disagree with one point that Mr. Black made. We've, that committee has worked for years yeah. uh, to oh, develop not uh, recommendations for how to do this yeah. the right way. So, yeah. so you think we ought to get on with it? Is that what you're saying? Yes, but <laughs> we, need the, we need the work from Congress. Respect we need the protections it. in the statute to, to make that Got happen. it. All right. Let me ask you about cybersecurity. Um, there are obviously threats uh, to the pipeline system. Um, as there are to the electric grid, as there are to you name it, and there are hackers out there. What tools do you need from us when it comes to cybersecurity that are lacking in this bill that you can talk about here? Do you want to go first? We take cybersecurity very seriously. Uh, I think Congress has acted on this in the FAA reauthorization last year to elevate the role of cyber within TSA, bring more resources there. Uh, we encourage Congress to appropriate more funds for TSA to do its work on cyber. Uh, attention on this issue from government agencies yeah. and Congress can only help. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know about the ranking member, Mr. Upton, but TSA has been less than cooperative with this committee right. as we delve into these issues. And, uh, it, it, you know, I'm not overly impressed. So um, I don't know if they're going to get more money at Mr. Upton. I don't know if you want to weigh in here. They're going to be checking you at that pre-check. I, I, I know, I I've know. Been, I've been it's, randomly it's selected like the last five weeks in a row. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Just have a smile on your face. That's right. My time's expired on that note. And, uh, yeah, thank you all for, for what you're doing. We want to get this right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yeah. hearing. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. McNerney for five minutes. From the great state of California. You forgot. <laughs> uh, from the great state of Southern California? Northern California. Northern California. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Lesniak. Uh, you referenced the uh, 2010 San Bruno uh, explosion that killed eight people. Uh, it took over an hour for crews to shut off the gas line after that explosion. Um, you pointed out that 19 years ago, Congress first uh, started de debating automatic uh, spill detection and shutoff valves, both which have, uh, would have assisted in that process. Can you speak to the importance of leak and rupture detection and the automatic uh, or remote control shutoff valves? Uh, yes, thank, thank you for that question. Uh, th I, I think it's critical. Uh, most new pipelines have both automatic and remote uh, controlled valves in them. Um, we ought to be retrofitting um, all pipelines with those. Um, there may be very specific, unique instances where it's not appropriate, but I think that those are very rare and that um, I think this ought to be a standard of practice. It's commonly used in the industry. It ought, to be used, it ought to be included in the statute. Well, the ranking member mentioned his concern about sh automatic shut off valves and so were one of the witnesses uh, in liquid pipelines. Is that an issue? Um, if a valve is improperly closed, closed, it can cause problems, can cause a release on a pipeline, absolutely. But automatic valves are used routinely in the industry, so they've apparently addressed that problem. Thank you. Mr. Osman, um, a major component of the bills that we discussed 
was the technology. Um, what additional technologies do you view as being essential to modernizing pipeline safety? Thank you for the question. We have a tremendous amount of opportunities today that we didn't have even 5, 10, 15 years ago to enhance the safety of our pipeline system with today's technologies. In particular, the one you'll hear us talking about the most is new internal inspection devices and new methods of analyzing the data that those devices produce. These are tools that are based on the same technology as an ultrasound machine or an MRI at the doctor's office, and they can detect problems inside the pipeline years before that problem actually results in a pipeline. That's amazing. It is amazing. What's the, what are the barriers to adopting that? Well, first, first FEMSA needs to complete the pending rulemaking that they've been working on and which everyone at this table is, is supportive of. But going forward beyond that, as we've talked about, we need opportunities to pilot these technologies moving forward so it does not take so many years to update the regulation. And one of the, one of the barriers to updating those regulations is not having that field tested data and that pilot program that FEMSA proposed would help us go a long way. Well, we heard a lot about uh, complaining about how FISMA is so slow in their rulemaking. What besides additional resources uh, would help in that process briefly for all the panelists, starting with Ms. Sames? I'd love to see a process that is done within DOT to move things faster. Uh, what I'm seeing is that the technical folks within FIMSA do a really good job of moving things quickly once the advisory committees have finished their deliberations. Mm. Uh, but there seems to be a delay from FIMSA to the Office of Management and Budget. I don't know where the delay is occurring, but to me, that's an area that could be investigated. Thank you. Yes, I, I would agree. FIMSA is, is doing their work. Um, often it seems to be, uh, get caught in the Secretary's office or in OMB. And as we mentioned earlier, we think this dupli duplicative cost-benefit analysis mm -hmm. that's, that's required in the, stat in the current statute also slows things down. Thank you. Mr. Black? I think a legislative analogy, rifle shot bills are often easier to move than Christmas tree bills or omnibus. We believe that FEMSA made strategic mistakes on gas and liquid regulations in the last Congress to lump a bunch of many complex, diverse issues into large mega rules that just overwhelmed the development process mm -hmm. and the review process. And that's the primary reason okay. that we're waiting for them today. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Osman. FEMSA has... Uh, Two advisory committees with 30 people on them total have a tremendous diversity of background and, and extent of experience in the pipeline industry, in the public space, in the regulator space. Uh, FIMSA should use those advisory committees earlier on to take input in the development of rulemakings uh, to make the rulemaking stronger from the get-go. So less of that work needs to be done at the back end when the advisory committees see the rulemaking proposal. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lesniak, you indicated that there are 435 miles of unregulated pipeline. What are the barriers to regulating those, pipe, those pipelines? Uh, thank you. It's 435,000 uh, miles what did of, I say? Of, of pipelines. Um, uh, the, uh, the barriers is that it's uh, not provided for in statute at all. All right. All right, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you for your responses. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Alano for five minutes. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for uh, holding today's hearing. And I'd also like to begin by just echoing uh, the uh, ranking member of the full committee and also the subcommittee's disappointment that the majority took a uh, partisan approach to a historically bipartisan topic by drafting this legislation for us in a vacuum. My hope is that because it is a discussion draft that the majority intends to work with us to move a bipartisan package forward. And I'm very interested in working with my colleagues, especially on using the best practices and technology to find the solutions leading to increased safety. Mr. Black, if I could uh, begin with you. In your written testimony, you proposed a pilot program for a new pipeline safety technologies and best practices. FEMSA also submitted a proposal for a pipeline safety pilot program that would give them some fl regulatory flexibility to allow new technology and safety methods. What's the problem you're trying to solve with this pilot program, and is this a situation where the regulations haven't kept, pack, kept pace with the innovation out there? The integrity management regulations for liquid pipelines are about 20 years old now, and they have not kept pace. They have gaps, including uh, cracking in pipelines. FEMSO has been slow uh, despite their efforts. 
uh, a pilot program that Motor Carrier has, the administration has now proposed, would let PHMSA test on operators of their choosing uh, methods, approaches, technologies that they believe would have an equivalent level of safety and gather data. We believe that data, when they gather them on the operators they choose, would help inform their regulations and speed up their rulemaking process so then they could apply those lessons uh, to all in industry. Uh, we're supportive of the proposal. We think there should be a few more provisions requiring reporting to Congress about the lessons from pilot programs and a trigger that requires them to then take those lessons that are positive and incorporate them in regulations. Let me follow up because you said that uh, you're looking at something that's 20 years old and uh, two things. One, why, why is it taking FEMSA this long to catch up with something that's over 20 years? And at the same time, would you describe some of the cost cut or the uh, cutting edge technologies and best practices that uh, your member companies would like to implement? Well, the technology is growing leaps and bounds in terms of pipeline inspection, uh, not just the tools that can run through a pipeline, but then also the analytics that can happen once the inline inspection device we call a smart pig comes out of the pipe. Uh, so we're learning more. The regulations are old. There's a floor. Pipeline operators are going well above them because of new, uh, best practices that we incorporate, that we suggest FEMSA often incorporate into regulation. They can update these. I spoke a moment ago about my personal thought and our organization's thought about the delay by FEMSA is taking too many issues and putting them in large rulemaking processes that are just slowing down. It shouldn't be 20 years. Hopefully it won't be 20 years again. Well, let me ask, does the draft legislation that's uh, before us uh, include anything like this to encourage the operators to adopt these new technologies on a voluntary basis? In the administration draft, yes. In the discussion draft from the subcommittee, no. Okay, thank you very much. Um, to uh, Ms. Uh, Sames and uh, Mr. Uh, Osmond and Mr. Black, if I could uh, kind of ask some quick questions here. As you know, the states oversee more than 80% of the nation's pipeline infrastructure, especially the gas distribution pipelines that connect our homes and businesses to the main transmission system. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the state programs and the relationship your member companies have with the states and the local pipe pipeline safety regulators? The same, same. Uh, yes. Uh, so if you, at the state level, especially if you're a larger operator, you're probably having multiple state inspectors in your office every day. Uh, they're in the field, they're with the operator, they're looking at various things which is why the state program is so important and why EG has always been supportive of additional funding for the states. Um, they're the ones regulating and if they, they need the proper training, the proper resources to do that. Um, unlike the FIMSA regulations, uh, the FIMSA regulators, the auditors, um, I think the, the interstates and the liquid industry see them a little less often than they do this, than we see the state operators um, at the state level. Um, FIMSA has responsibility to provide oversights of the states, the state inspectors. Um, they're relying on the state regulators uh, to go out and do their job, uh, which also gets back to why FIMSA needs additional resources. Okay. And I know, Mr. Chairman, my time's expiring, but I will uh, submit my questions in writing to the witnesses. Thank you very much. How are you, Ben? The Chair now recognizes the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rush. Uh, in his testimony, Mr. Black of the oil pipeline industry states that, and I quote, applying an ambiguous legal standard of recklessness will not advance pipeline safety. And Mr. Black would also have you believe, in my opinion, that requiring a prosecutor to prove that someone is both knowing and willful is standard legal fare, whereas in reality, most statutes require proof that someone is either knowing or willful, so rather than and or. So I wanted to ask Mr. Um, Lesniak, is reckless an ambiguous legal standard or is there a precedent in statute for holding someone accountable for reckless behavior? Uh, th thank you. Uh, it's far from ambiguous or unusual. It's commonly used in other federal statute and in fact in most uh, states it's included in the Motor Vehicle Code and other criminal statutes. It's, it's a common term in law. And then doesn't the current hazardous materials safety statute contain criminal penalties for someone who willfully or recklessly violates the requirement of the Federal Hazardous Material Transportation Law? Yes, in fact, it does. 
So I think this is neither novel nor ambiguous, and in my view, it would certainly improve accountability uh, and safety. Mr. Lesniak, let me ask you another question. What do you think has been the holdup on the mandates from the 2011 and 2016 acts? Do you think that this is due to the duplicative and prescriptive cost benefit required in uh, current law? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, or yes, it, it, I think it is a big part of it. it. It's not the only reason, but it is one of the key reasons, and it and we need to get that addressed. I mean, I think the statutory cost benefit analysis clearly ties the secretary's hands. Uh, so my question is, would eliminating it help prevent the extreme delays we've seen uh, from occurring again? Yes, we think it would. All right, thank you. Let me go to. Um, Mr. Lesniak, again, about this mandamus issue. In the aftermath of the San Bruno incident, the city of San Francisco was blocked in court from forcing FIMSA to uphold its statutory responsibilities. And this happened because the court held that the law did not allow for mandamus-type citizen suits to be brought against the federal government. So, Mr. Lesniak, do we need the ability for citizens, states, and local governments to be able to compel FIMSA to do its job? I, I think there's I think there's no question. Uh, you know, if, if you think the delays that we're seeing, that Congress gets frustrated with these delays, uh, with implementing the regulations, how do you think a community like San Francisco, San Bruno, Edison, Bellingham uh, feel when they have incidents um, and or they have pipelines in their communities that they have concerns about and they can't get FEMSA to act? Congress can hold these agencies accountable, but it may take years, if at all. And uh, the public needs to have the ability to go to court to get these agencies to implement um, these regulations. That Congress is representative of the people. The people ought to have the ability to enforce the laws um, Congress passes. Well, thank you. I, I wanted to ask you, you know, the industry, if, from their testimony, the Interstate Natural Gas Association is seems, in my opinion, I mean, I'm putting words in their mouth, but from what I can see from their testimony, it's perfectly fine. They're perfectly fine with the status quo of rulemakings that take a decade or more. They seem to suggest we don't need to use modern technology like automatic or remote valves or smart pigs, and that we shouldn't review the integrity of pipelines that are half a century older or older. According to their testimony, a rulemaking process that never ends seems to be fine, and anything Congress might do to ensure faster results or improve pipeline safety and hold operators more accountable, and I quote, would overrule years of work in developing new pipeline safety regulations for gas transmission pipelines. But of course, what good, I mean, in my opinion, what good does it do the public to have a rulemaking process that goes on and on and never produces a rule? I mean, that's my problem. So let me ask you, do you think that the industry's opposition to new safety requirements is contributing to the growing opposition of landowners to having a pipeline run through their states, towns, and backyards? Because this is what I hear all the time. Is that, uh, is this opposition to these new safety requirements contributing to that? I, I think it is. I, I think that the industry um, does uh, throw comments and engage with the rulemaking process sometimes in a way that's counterproductive and slows down the process. And um, for, for some in the industry, I, th I think it works in their favor, that they, they would prefer to pr uh, preserve the status quo. But then at the same time, you have this growing opposition from the landowners, and I think, you know, this only contributes to that. So I don't, I don't know that it's in their interest, but whatever. Thank you. Thanks so much. The Chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Texas, Ms. Olson. I thank the Chair and welcome to our four expert witnesses. My first question is a simple yes or no. Are pipelines safer than trucks, trains, ships for transporting liquid and gas products? Ms. Sames, yes or no? Yes, based on DOT statistics. Mr. Lesniak, yes or no? Pipeline safer? Yes, but it's an apples and oranges comparison. Mr. Black? Yes. Yes. Mr. Osmond agrees. So we all agree that pipelines are as close as we get to perfection transporting products, liquid products right now with what we have in our, in our world. Another simple yes or no question for all of you. As Mr. Doyle mentioned, we have a bill that allows FERC 
to exceed the federal pay limits for the export employees that are getting taken by the private sector basically because they don't have the money to pay them. Would you all support your organizations, something like that for FEMSA? Because we've heard over and over, manpower is a problem. How about allowing FEMSA to pay more than the federal minimum? Ms. Sames? Yes. 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 We support the federal government for FEMSA inspectors being able to pay more to attract and retain inspectors. Mr. Osman. Yes. There we go. Okay. Uh, let's talk about FEMSA. Right now, they're in the middle of a careful effort to set new rules for gathering lines. Um, living in the suburbs of Houston, Texas, the energy capital of the world, I know how important these lines are to production of mostly oil and natural gas. Um, they're important for the safety they provide and also the ability to expand the system. And while gathering lines may look like other pipelines, they're very, very different because they have very low pressures compared to pipelines that transport the product from Texas up there to New England. And it seems to me that our draft legislation is upending FEMA's work with their efforts for new rules for gathering lines. And this is for you, Mr. Black, and you, Mr. Osmond. Can you talk about how these lines are regulated today and what FEMSA is doing, we think they're going when they update these regulations, and what are the costs of Congress stepping in and expanding FEMSA's, FEMSA's jurisdiction while they're still trying to get a handle on new rules? Thank you for the question. Uh, of course, we agree that it's important that all pipelines are safe. Our members, Inga, we represent the interstate natural gas transmission pipelines. We don't represent gathering pipelines, so I can't get into the specifics there. I will say from a process perspective, FEMSA's advisory committee is meeting next week to try to advance that gathering rulemaking forward. And if recent history is any indication, they're going to be successful in doing so. Mr. Black? This new effort has been about gas gathering. Uh, liquids often is already regulated by FEMSA above certain, below certain diam above certain diameters and thresholds. It's been primarily a gas gathering push. One final question for you, Ms. Sames and Mr. Black and Mr. Osmond, one more time. <coughs> I've heard over and over today in this hearing and out back home about how long it takes FEMSA to set new rules to, for these pipeline systems. And that's why I have concern. We're going to actually slow that process down with these new writs of mandamus. Uh, this new law will encourage more lawsuits from special interest groups with no standing and also lead to backdoor rules settled through sue and settle. And going through a back door is never safe as opposed to going through a front door. So my question for all of y'all is, do you think this discussion draft mandamus provision would impact the quality and pace of FEMSA's rulemakings? Would it hurt it? Yes. Yes, if we think FEMSA is overwhelmed by congressional mandates, think about how they'd be overwhelmed with litigation from groups that can choose what to sue on. Uh, we think court forced action would usurp the role of Congress in setting priorities, would divert them from whatever they think their highest priority is, and it would create that risk of sue and settle rulemaking outside of the process where all stakeholders have an opportunity to participate. I think it hurts. Mr. Osmond. I agree with my colleagues. Uh, we're all frustrated about the pace of rulemakings and we're not happy with the status quo, but uh, we do not think the mandamus provision is going to speed things up. We think we need more focused decision making from the agency. And we need to do what we can to help them get the resources that they need to move these important rulemakings forward. Thank you. Our time, Mr. Lizdak, one compliment for you being from Austin, Texas, the bowl game. We had the Longhorns against the Georgia Bulldogs. Bevo, our Longhorn mascot, tore into that little bulldog. So thank you, made Texas proud. Welcome. There you go. Yield, hook him. Yield back. The chair now who recognizes Mr. Lofsang for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today as well. I am pleased that the committee is holding this hearing uh, on this incredibly important issue of pipeline safety in America. And before I go any further, I should mention, too, that I, I think that what we're talking about today, while we're talking a lot about regulation and, and all the rest, I think it also points up 
uh, how important a new infrastructure bill would be because we have such an aging system of pipelines out there. We're going to have to make replacements. We're going to make repairs. We're going to have to do all these things to make sure that we can continue to transport the energy that gets transported. That's got to be a, a part of a larger infrastructure bill, I believe, and I think that's actually something maybe we can all agree on on a bipartisan basis uh, here as well. I don't want to make too many assumptions, however, uh, about the nature of politics in this body at the moment, but I, I do think we can agree on that. Um, our nation's pipeline system does help deliver reliable and low-cost energy to consumers across the country. Ensuring that our pipelines operate safely, reliably, and efficiently is absolutely critical. I think that's a no-brainer. Uh, we must also ensure that we are taking proactive measures to protect our pipelines from both physical and cyber threats, that's been mentioned, cyber threats, that would put our nation's energy supply at great risk, those threats out there. We know that cyber attacks are a near constant and increasingly dangerous threat to our energy infrastructure as well as to the surrounding communities. Federal pipeline safety regulations must keep pace with the capabilities of those who seek to attack our energy supply and undermine our nation, national security. And to that end, I'm happy I've been working with Ranking Member Upton on a piece of legislation that would approve the coordination and information sharing among the federal entities tasked with overseeing the cyber security of our nation's pipeline system, the Pipeline and LNG Facility Cybersecurity Preparedness Act. I look forward to continuing to work on this important issue as this committee moves forward on comprehensive pipeline safety legislation. Concerning the legislation that's before us today, the Safer Pipelines Act does include a provision that I think is critically important in ensuring our communities are better protected from the potential impacts of a pipeline incident. This provision would require that the owners or operators of a gas or hazardous liquid pipeline engage and share information. It's been mentioned with local emergency planning committees and other local first responders. This will ensure that those individuals who are first to the scene in the event of an accident are able to respond as effectively as possible to protect the surrounding community. Those first responders, we all know, are absolutely critical. We've had a lot of floods in Iowa over the past 10 years since I've been in office, 10, 12 years. This kind of an incident would be absolutely it would be absolutely essential for those first responders to have as much information as possible as well. And I know we talked about this already a little bit, but Mr. Lesniak, in your testimony, you highlighted this effort to engage with the emergency planning committees and first responders and improve communication and education efforts within communities. Can you elaborate again, if you would, on how you think information sharing with state and local emergency responders can help ensure the safety of our communities and improve outcomes in the event of an incident? Just elaborate on what you've already been talking about earlier, if you would. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, local emergency responders have a hard time getting information about pipelines. And um, as I said, it's a voluntary process. Some operators are real good about it. Some operators are not very good about it. But it's the local emergency responders that have to be able to act quickly to, to protect their communities. And so anything that Congress can do to make sure that critical information is shared with local LEPCs, uh, local fire departments, and other first responders, I think is critical. So in terms of what these local communities can do themselves to take steps to protect themselves from the impacts of an incident. Do you have any specific ideas about that? I, I, I do. Uh, I worked with, uh, I personally worked with uh, lo uh, a local pipeline operator um, to develop a, an emergency re spill response plan for Austin, Texas to protect Barton Springs, one of our critical natural resources there. And they worked well with us and, it, and that process worked really well. Um, other communities and uh, could do that. Other pipeline operators that we reached out to in our community weren't interested in working with us. And I just might say, you know, I, I'm near the end here. Um, I do worry about not just cybersecurity attacks, but I worry about physical attacks. And I did go on the mapping uh, uh, website that you mentioned earlier, and there's a lot of information that the public does need. But that information is available to the bad guys too. And we have to be thinking about how to balance, you know, uh, those, those kinds of interests that we have as, as, as a public, but also making sure that we secure these, these pipelines from the bad guys who want to do ter terrible damage to us and can inflict terroristic kinds of actions on us. We have to be careful on that front. So thank you very much. I appreciate the time and uh, yield back. Thank you. Mr. Griffin is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Picking up on that, talking about bad guys uh, 
physically attacking the pipeline. That's a concern of mine, too. And I visited uh, with uh, some folks, and I know there's other folks doing this, too, but Corning has a product where they can actually uh, put a, a fiber down on the pipeline as it's being laid. And you can see if somebody walks up to it, drives up to the pipeline, starts digging. I mean, any of those things that would tip you off that one of the bad guys might be out there uh, also has the advantage of because of the, the temperature being colder uh, with the gas in the pipeline than the soil around it, that if there is a leak, it, it, it picks up that temperature change and can identify a leak fairly quickly. So along those lines, I know that, that, that that's out there, and I know there's probably some other technologies as well that are emerging. I'm just wondering what you all think the federal government might be able to do to encourage more new technologies like this. And then, of course, I know it's not your, your bailiwick, but then we've got to convince FERC that it probably ought to be there. If, yes, ma'am. And I'm, I apologize. I'm, I'm a little passionate about technology. I, sp I helped revamp the PHMSA R&D program. I then went from there to a research consortium. Um, so for me, it's additional funding for technology. Uh, we have it within PHMSA, we have a little bit within Department of Energy, but more technology funding to get us the products that we need. The industry is contributing a good bit also. Uh, we've already mentioned fast, uh, piloting these technologies so we can get them into the market faster. Um, all of that will help move things forward. And, and talking about the proposed, uh, the, I know the administration's proposed a technology pilot program, you know, how do you think that would work? Obviously you're favorable, but how do you think their program would work in, in moving some of this technology forward? I would hope that it moves things faster, that if they have an official program that's, that's, that Congress has approved, that it allows them to move faster. Yeah. Because right now they're doing it, but it's at a pretty slow pace. And, and, and I certainly would support uh, putting more funding towards the research. I'm, I'm big on research, and I think it's important. And I do think the question that uh, Mr. Pallone asked earlier, uh, Mr. Lesniak, was that, was that is some of the concerns about pipelines causing some of the resistance to uh, new pipelines? I think the answer to that is clearly yes. Uh, there's a pipeline going through my district, and some folks are going to be against it no matter what, and there are other reasons to be against it, but some folks are just worried because of some of the safety issues that they've heard about. And the more we can do to reassure them, I think, better off we are. Mr. Black, you want to make a quick comment on this? Yes. The, the, the technology you described mm -hmm. is, is interesting, and I think it needs to be reviewed regularly by the advisory committee groups. Uh, Mr. Lesniak is on one of them. Pipeline operators are. Uh, Congress told PHMSA that it needs to put its regulations and its cost-benefit and risk assessments before the advisory committees. I think Congress could also tell them to review research and development, have PHMSA put forward its proposals and hear from other organizations that uh, collaboration right now occurs, but it's not frequent enough. If you all put that in the statute, that should increase it. All right, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm going to go to a, an area that hasn't been touched on yet and just ask if anybody has any ideas. Uh, I met with, I don't know, a few months back some uh, folks at Virginia Tech, and they are doing research related to water and sewer pipes. And one of the things that they found was that the age of the pipe was not dispositive, nor the material. That one of the things that was interesting was the type of soil and what environment the, the pipe was in. So I noticed in the bill that there's several mentions of the age of the pipe and what material it is and cast iron pipes. But at least for water and sewer, they, they talked about if it was in the right type of soil, cast iron might last 100 years. Mm -hmm. In a different type of soil, it may not make it to 50 years, and you want to make sure you know what kind of soil you're in and whether or not, interestingly enough, apparently degradation in, uh, in and around railroads was higher. And I thought that was fascinating. Is there any research going on in this regard with uh, uh, gas pipelines as well to make sure that, we're, that, I mean, we can go out there and say you check them every 50 years, and that's great. But if you've got a pipe that's in a soil type or in an environment where it would last 100, why would we spend money on that? And let's focus on the areas where it's most important. Yeah, I mean, on the gas distribution side, we're doing a lot on replacement. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're looking at a number of factors, and the environment is one of those factors. Um, so you're, uh, and, and the, the pipe tells you a good bit. So if you're going out doing leak surveys, which we're required to do, and checking very particular areas and doing more, especially for cast iron and bare steel, when temperatures change and that, that frost level in certain areas of the country, um, I know that down south you don't have it, but we do up north, that frost level changes, the, the, the soil moves. Mm -hmm. So 
that causes extra strain on the pipe. It's all things that have to be taken into account, and it's, we've done a lot of research in this area. Well, and I would hope that any bill that we would pass would take into account some of the new technology and take into account the fact that not every pipe, every pipe is the same as a pipe in, the same, in a different soil type or different area. Thank you very much. I yield back. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Kennedy for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, uh, for having this important hearing to address pipeline safety, and thank you to our witnesses for being here. We all recall the devastating events that happened last year when a distribution line exploded on September 13th, wreaking havoc in three communities in the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts. Local residents and first responders were gravely injured, homes destroyed, families displaced for months on end, and a young man named Lionel Rendon lost his life. Ten months later, these communities are still recovering from the devastation. I'm grateful to my colleague, Representative Lori Trahan, for introducing H.R. 2139, the Lionel Rendon Pipeline Safety Act, to address the issues leading to this tragic event. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor with this legislation. I'd also like to thank Senator Markey for introducing the Senate version. Now, Mr. Lesniak, your testimony, you speak to the importance of pipeline companies developing and implementing a continuous improvement safety management system, or SMS. You know, the Merrimack Valley tragedy illuminated one of uh, the fact that voluntary systems of SMS weren't incentivizing all companies. So, sir, I appreciate the idea of an annual filing with FIMSA uh, as a level of accountability without making SMS mandatory. Those who have fully embraced SMS should have no problem, but do you believe that will be enough of an incentive for those that are lagging behind? Thank you. Uh, you know, there ought to be a regulatory floor and for critical um, safety processes. And so, so I think those types of safety processes should be required and not voluntary. Good operators implement them, bad operators don't. Thank you, sir. As you are well aware, there's a $2 million cap on FIMS's penalty authority for civil penalties. Do you believe that the fines currently assessed provide sufficient deterrent for companies that commit a violation? Uh, no, I don't. Um, if you're looking at, at uh, the, some of these pipelines, for example, there's a pipeline that's being proposed for this, uh, in the state of Texas right now. It's a $2 billion project. It's going to um, uh, trans transport millions of cubic feet of natural gas per day. Um, a million dollar or a two million dollar fine is a uh, drop in the bucket for companies like that. And sir, I've heard and said by some skeptics that you, quote, can't create a culture of safety. But it seems to me that Congress has, in fact, forced change where industry has failed to take adequate safety steps. Do you have any response to those that think that this is a fool's errand? Um, I, I think that you can't regu regulate necessarily a culture of safety, but again, you can set a floor that makes sure that every company meets minimum safety standards and, um, that, and make it more uh, ubiquitous across the industry. And final question uh, for you, sir. Across the country, particularly at the state level, we are seeing concerning efforts to curb the rights of Americans, including particularly Native communities, to raise their voices in defense of pipeline safety. Often those communities stand to be the most impacted by proposed projects such as the Dakota Access um, project that, uh, across dr drinking water and burial grounds for the Standing Rock Sioux. The administration's proposal to reauthorize FIMSA goes even further than current law, proposing to criminalize rightful, peaceful protests in the name of pipeline safety. I would imagine we can all agree that an effort to sabotage or physically damage a pipeline is one thing, with a gun or explosives or, again, some other way to damage the integrity of the actual um, infrastructure. But a very different uh, exercise to uh, use one's free speech rights to peacefully protest a proposed construction project under construction. So, Mr. Lesniak, how can we ensure the balance between First Amendment and community voices and meaningful dissent are protected uh, in our pipeline safe, safety efforts, and how can we better account for tribal and indigenous rights? Uh, I think the, the Pipeline Safety Trust has, has spoken clearly about if anyone um, takes action to damage or disrupt the operation of a pipeline, that's wrong and it's not safe and it threatens the public safety and threatens the environment, and that ought to be addressed. However, legitimate dissent and protest by the public um, should be uh, clearly protected. In the state of Texas, the state legislature recently has criminalized legitimate dissent, and it's, and it's wrong, and that should not happen. And it, but as long as we're protecting the pipelines and those operations, that's what we should do is if, it's, if it creates a public safety threat. Otherwise, Congress should stay out of it. All right. Any additional comments from anybody else? Mr. Black? AOPL would like to deter attacks on mm -hmm. pipelines that could harm the environment or the public or the mm -hmm. assailants themselves. We are not trying to deter peaceful, nonviolent protests. 
Appreciate that. You yield back. Thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Kinsinger for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank you all for being here today. We appreciate it. I'd like to start with uh, cybersecurity. And some of the questions I'm going to ask, I know we've already touched on these topics, but I, I do have different questions on them. Uh, I don't believe we can separate pipeline safety from pipeline security. Multiple federal agencies have a role to play when it comes to pipeline cybersecurity. Given that the DOE is already the lead sector-specific agency for energy, and given the fact that they already have tremendous experience and resources dedicated to pipeline cybersecurity, especially through the national labs, I think we need to address this in the pipeline safety bill. So for uh, Mr. Black, Ms. Sames, and uh, Mr. Osmond, each of you have supported H.R. 370, the Pipeline and LNG Facility Cybersecurity Preparedness Act. Would any of you have any objection to including it in the uh, pipeline safety reauthorization? And specifically, if you do, why? We'll start with you. I, we're supportive of the coordination role, which is in that bill. Um, so I, I think there's, I'd, I'd have to see, I'm an engineer, which means I need the details. Yeah. But in theory, yes, we could probably support. I'm a politician. We need details, too, <laughs> before we commit to anything. So it always comes back to get us. The public-private collaboration on cybersecurity has been good. And as you say, multiple agencies should have roles. We were proud to support the bill through the committee process. We encourage on cyber a holistic approach so that you don't have duplication of government agencies, right. conflicting guidance to all of us. So we think that means involving intelligence committees, transportation committees. We, I would discourage you from linking the two on legislation. We want reauthorization legislation to pass. I think if you do both of them together, it slows reauthorization. reauthorization. That's your prerogative, but if you're trying to achieve both, I would recommend you do them separately. Yeah. Okay. And I agree that. with Mr. Block on that. All right. I agree with my colleagues. Um, you know, we, we advocate for a comprehensive government-wide approach to pipeline cybersecurity, collaboration, coordination between the different agencies that have different important roles. Share Mr. Black's concern that uh, you know, bringing it into the reauthorization bill could could slow down a timely reauthorization. But other than that, it's certainly your prerogative. You understood. Uh, in December of 2012, in the December 2018 report, GAO significantly raised concerns about TSA's pipeline security program. I'm concerned that the TSA is not prioritizing pipeline security as they should. For example, it's already been mentioned they have over 50,000 employees, but only six were assigned to pipeline security as of last year. Uh, Mr. Osman, are you concerned about TSA staffing issues, and have you made any recommendations to improve that situation? Thank you for the question. Oh, my, yep, I am on. Thank you for the question. Uh, certainly it's important that TSA, as the lead safety regular, regulator, has the resources that they need. Uh, our association, INGA, along with the other associations represented at the table, have made appropriations recommendations mm -hmm. to increase the funding that TSA has, to increase the resources that they can bring to the table. We have seen over the last year, uh, certainly due to the pressure from this committee and others, uh, a concerted effort at TSA to adopt the recommendations that the GAO gave them and to improve their performance. They've rolled out a new pipeline cybersecurity assessment initiative, which we're participating in actively, and has helped a lot. Okay, great. Um, and are you concerned? Well, I'll say this. TSA conducts interviews with operators known as the corporate security reviews, but TSA doesn't track the information or use it to measure risk. Are you concerned about the way these corporate security reviews are being conducted, or and do you have any recommendations on that level either? As I mentioned, that program has evolved to this newer uh, pipeline cybersecurity initiative. We know that they're implementing the recommendations of the GAO, which included some of the tracking and data collection that you're talking about. So we'll need to keep watching that and see how it. But you feel like we're on a comfortable track with that. A good start, I guess. Yeah, we're, good start. That's okay. The, that's the way we put it. Hopefully, we get a good ending too. Mr. Black, are attacks on pipelines an ongoing problem, and how are the attacks on pipeline facilities a threat to safety and public of the public and the environment? I'm sure you've a answered this in numerous ways, but in 2016, there was a coordinated series of attacks where people broke chains, opened perimeter fencing, and tried to turn valves on pipelines, covering about 15 percent of our daily crude oil use. Uh, thankfully, they did not result in a rupture, but they could have by improperly forcing closed uh, a valve. 2017, there was an attack. 2019, there was an attack. There was an attack on a pipeline just before it 
started an operation, if it had started operation without that uh, damage being addressed, it would have caused a problem. We believe there are loopholes in federal law on operating, on construction, and on d uh, actions that don't damage or destroy, but that could, that need to be closed by Congress so that we deter these attacks. Thank you. And as a guy that lives on top of a bunch of pipelines and near them, they're really important, but this is a very important issue as well. So I thank you and I yield back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Measley for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing to talk about uh, pipeline safety. I think that all of us can agree that, uh, that we do not want to lose another life and that we do not want to incur any further damage uh, because these pipeline explosions can be absolutely uh, devastating, including death. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Chairman Pallone and Congresswoman Lori uh, Trahan for their efforts to prevent deadly pipeline explosions uh, like the one that happened in the district that I represent in Dallas uh, where we lost 12-year-old uh, Linda uh, Michelita Rogers uh, last year in the city of Dallas. Uh, we have to do everything we can to obviously prevent uh, us having another incident like that. And I know that that's something that, that all of you sitting at the table would agree with. Uh, one powerful tool we have as lawmakers is the imposition of civil penalties to make sure that people are doing everything they can uh, to prevent another incident uh, like what happened in Massachusetts, like what happened in Dallas uh, from ever occurring uh, again, to make sure that people aren't putting profits ahead of people. I think that everyone would also agree that you don't want to put profits ahead of people. Um, in the state legislature in Texas this year, uh, my former colleague, uh, State Representative Rafael Anchia from Dallas, uh, he was able to get a pipeline safety uh, bill passed. But as a, as a companion piece on the federal uh, end, uh, uh, Representative Trahan's uh, Pipeline Safety Act bill would increase penalties for companies that violate the law up to $200 million for the most egregious violations. And I wanted to ask Mr. Lisniak, uh, while the civil penalties alone cannot prevent uh, tragedies like the ones I just mentioned from happening again, in your opinion, how will the increases in penalties included in Congresswoman Trahan's bill uh, impact the decisions that are made by these pipeline operators? I think any time that we make substantive, substantial penalties for bad actors, it's a good thing. They will be more likely to take into account. You know, I, I work with pipeline operators all the time as, as in my role uh, on the Technical Advisory Committee and working with the Pipeline Safety Trust in FEMSA. And those companies that engage in those processes on a regular basis, those are generally the good operators. We write regulations and create penalties for the bad actors, and you need to make, make it so that they think twice before they don't do things that they know they ought to be doing. Uh, uh, pipeline industry associations uh, develop operating best practices based on the recommendation of their uh, engineers and experts. Uh, where appropriate, uh, where do you think uh, 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 PHMSA can take advantage of these best practices to improve pipeline safety? Anyone can answer that? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, what's important is that FEMSA continues to uh, embrace the latest technologies and engineering practices that those that those consensus technical standards represent. Um, in FEMSA's bill, they or you know, draft legislation, they have proposed uh, some language along those lines to require the agency to continue to be focused on ensuring the latest uh, engineering technical standards are incorporated into its regulations. And that's important because we have a lot of standards in there right now that are many decades old. For example, the fundamental gas transmission pipeline standard, ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, B318S, the version that's incorporated in the regulations today was written in 2004. There's been five versions published since then, each one better than the last. So, you know, this is an opportunity to, by simply changing some references, doing a quick review of the new documents, to demonstra demonstrably improve pipeline safety with relatively little effort. I know that on May 1st uh, at a pipeline safety oversight hearing that there was concern about uh, rulemaking uh, uh, taking uh, too long to complete. What, what do you think that we can do to help speed that up and, and help make that situation better? Thank you for the question. Um, you know, part of it, as my colleague Mr. Black mentioned earlier, is in doing what you all are doing to encourage FIMSA about what the priorities really are to get those mandates done. We do think that FIMSA made a mistake uh, in years past by trying to lump just too many different unrelated initiatives together and that slowed down every step in the process from A to Z. 
I think also opportunities to um, look at resource levels in FIMSA with provisions like the subcommittee's draft direct hire proposal could go a long way to help as well. So with, with your interest in uh, best practices in those kind of market levels and other technical experts, uh, you've got an opportunity. Uh, we've discussed here about best practices that have been updated, but those updates have not been incorporated into federal regulations. Uh, those updates require all operators to comply. So you've got the opportunity in the administration's recommendation to require FEMSA to regularly review updates and to decide to incorporate they. That's uh, Congress setting a priority for FEMSA of harnessing new technology. Just as Mr. Osmond said for natural gas, the same is true on liquids. We've got a recommended practice 1160 on integrity management, inspection and maintenance. Let's get those updates rolled into regulations. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yield back my time. The chair now recognizes Mr. Jocelyn for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for uh, for conducting this hearing today. A really important uh, topic, uh, and and I hope that as we move forward, our our energy and commerce majority will seek to make this historically bipartisan process just that bipartisan. Uh, we should not be playing politics with pipeline safety, but instead. We should be working on a bill that has received proper and necessary technical feedback from FEMSA and all members of this committee. We all want to produce a bill that can help address the current challenges and opportunities of our pipeline system. We all want a bill that promotes safety, allows for technological innovation, and correctly addresses emerging physical, uh, physical and cyber threats. That's the bill we should all be working on, and I hope we can eventually work together on those issues. Uh, Ms. Sames, uh, we obviously need to do everything we can to minimize events within our pipeline infrastructure. I think everyone shares that goal. Uh, everyone would also agree that it is incumbent on this committee and industry to ensure that we're doing everything we can to correctly respond to those in incidents when they unfortunately occur. So when pipeline incidents do occur, how do gas utilities communicate with first responders and how can we here in Congress help improve that communication? Because our companies, uh, the distribution companies are in the communities that they serve it's a much closer relationship. We're support. We're doing immediate outreach. Um, we're, we're doing outreach in advance to make sure that the emergency responders in that area know where the pipelines are and and what's in those particular lines, those distribution lines. Because we have so many excavation damages, individuals hitting our lines because they're not either calling before they dig or they're not abiding the lines. Uh, we have the, a lot of opportunities to do emergency response on the distribution side. So they know us, they know us well, they're coordinating with us. We do incident, incident command structure similar to the fire departments so that when we're on the scene, um, they know that their job is to keep things safe till we get there. Our job is to make sure that the pipeline stays safe. So it's a nice tag team between the two. On the information that they need, it's that close coordination in advance and good coordination and communication once on site. Okay, can can you talk briefly about the importance of allowing operators to make uh, uh, to successfully perform an initial assessment after an incident? I mean, what what arises if someone makes a wrong assessment? Uh, so tell me tell me what you think about operators doing the initial assessment. So what could happen if somebody makes a wrong assessment and and one of our concerns has always been some emergency responders are very gung-ho. They see a fire. They, they want to make sure that things are taken care of, and we try our best to make sure that they're not turning valves because, as was heard all earlier, you turn the wrong valve and many bad things can happen. So on the assessment after an incident, after we get on site, it's what occurred, how did it occur, who was involved, 
um, we're trying to gather as much information as possible so that we can make the right decisions. And no one better than the operators are, are poised to, to, to do that assessment, wouldn't you agree? We're the technical yeah. experts. Yeah. So we should know our lines. We should be familiar with our lines. We should know um, everything about them. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Black, uh, a bipartisan concern expressed at the May 1st pipeline safety oversight hearing was uh, PHMSA taking too long to complete their mandated rulemakings. Um, what can we do to help that situation? Well, first, encourage PHMSA to not lump too many complex issues into large rulemakings that overwhelm the process. Second, help them gain information. We've got a recommendation from AOPL that the administration made to follow something that's in the motor carrier statute that allows a pilot program. PHMSA, at its discretion, can choose certain operators to test new technologies and approaches that it believes should have an equivalent level of safety. Then they can gather information from that. Uh, some have, some have, have, have expressed concerns that the requirement for uh, PHMSA to do a cost-benefit analysis of, of their rule is partially to blame. Do you, do you see that? No, sir, not at all. It's going to be required ultimately because of executive order. Uh, it should be done early. It should be done and vetted with a uh, stakeholder group as it is today at the advisory committees. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. O'Halloran, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Upton, and our witnesses here today to discuss the legislative proposals before us uh, to reauthorize the National Pipeline Safety Framework. While I know there are various perspectives being represented on our witnesses panel today, I'd like to echo the chairman's remarks in that this is simply the continuation of our conversation on pipeline safety. And this bill will evolve where it, from where it is today. I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle on a bipartisan framework which truly provides public safety and oversight of our pipeline infrastructure. Um, Ms. Sames, uh, you mentioned during uh, your, uh, part of the discussion on pipeline safety, and you used the word proper resources. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have the proper resources? Is there the proper funding uh, out there in the field from both the federal government, the state government, and others that in the industry to be able to address the safety issues for our citizens? I think FEMSA could use some additional funding. I also think that uh, they've done a really good job revamping their training program for both federal and state regulators. Um, I think it can, I think additional funding there can also help. I've heard concerns that it can take a little while for the inspectors to get through that training. So additional resources that will help with that training portion. Also research, you've already heard me say, I think they need additional money for research and development so that they can implement pilots move technology forward, implement pilots, and get the technology out in the field faster than it is currently. On the state side, uh, the states uh, need more funding. Um, they need the ability to pay their inspectors more. They need the proper training. So I'm a fan of both. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Lesniak, I think it was you that mentioned bad actors. Uh, what, what, how do you define bad actors and what is the industry doing within itself uh, to identify who these are and to address those issues? Uh, you know, uh, over the last 20 years that I've been in, involved in, in pipeline issues, uh, you know, I, I've dealt with operators uh, that are, are really good. Uh, they're very proactive. They go well above and beyond uh, the minimum standards in the, in the regulations. Um, and I've also dealt with pipeline operators that do the bare minimum and sometimes uh, not even that. And, and that's, that's how I would define a bad actor is, is an operator that's just doing the bare minimum or less. And what is the industry, that, to your knowledge, doing to address that and call out those bad actors? You know, I, I, I think my colleagues here on, on the panel, you know, their, their industry is doing training, they're doing outreach. Um, but... I, you know, I suspect that they would tell you that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't always make them drink. Well, I'll, I'll go down that road another time. <laughs> uh, Mr. Osman, I, I just wanted to point out that you also mentioned a concern with uh, 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 some of the financial issues as it relates to getting regulatory uh, issues taken care of. And I, 
I just wanted to identify the overall issues out here. Uh, Mr. Black, in FIMSA's recent legislative proposal to Congress for the reauthorization of Pipeline Safety Act, it includes the authority for FIMSA to evaluate and implement a safety incentives program for operators who voluntarily exceed minimum federal standards for pipeline safety. It also proposes a pipeline safety technology program to test the latest technologies in controlled, well, real-world settings. Do you believe these proposals deserve more consideration as we move beyond today's proposed discussion drafts? Why or why not? Thank you, Congressman. The second one you mentioned, the pilot program, uh, we particularly encourage. We think it's going to lead to quicker rulemakings and better use of technology. We suggest two additions to what the administration suggested. One, reporting to Congress on the, and the public about the lessons from them. Two, a requirement that they roll those positive lessons into future regulations. The first one that you mentioned is interesting on in safety incentives. It may be more gas focused. I'd be interested to learn more about that. And on your question about resources, the problems that we have heard is FEMSA's difficulty through the federal hiring process and the salaries that it can pay to hire quality inspectors and then to retain them when they have lucrative options, including in the private sector. So we've recommended Schedule A hiring authority if that helps, the direct hire authority in the subcommittee's discussion draft. That could be the way to go. We've supported that as well. We want FEMSA to be able to attract and retain quality inspectors. Well, given the time, I have some more questions. I'll, I'll put those in writing. But uh, uh, I, I just, uh, my background in, in law enforcement tells me that uh, uh, you have, have to have consistency, you have to have a, enough personnel to identify the issues and to address them in a timely manner, and you have to be proactive about these issues. And it's apparent now that all four of you have identified funding as a cru crucial issue and retention now also. Uh, that we need to find a way to address those issues, and, and I yield. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Flores for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And uh, Leader Upton, I appreciate uh, you all holding today's hearing. I share many of the concerns that have been expressed on this side of the aisle uh, today at the dais uh, regarding the, uh, uh, this discussion draft and the process by which it has come in front of us today. Uh, in particular, I'm still waiting on information from the May hearing uh, with uh, uh, FEMSA, and I understand the majority has not uh, has, has submitted our written request yet to the uh, witnesses from that hearing, and I uh, and those requests included my own, so I'm hoping that the majority will hurry up and get that to the witnesses, because it seems reasonable to me that before we start working on legislation, we'd at least have a complete record from the uh, prior hearing before we move forward in the legislative process. I'd first like to talk about pipeline vandalism now, uh, FEMSA has proposed strengthening the existing criminal measures for attacking a pipeline facility. We've also received a letter that Mr. Black uh, spoke of earlier in his uh, opening statements in support of this provision from some of the unions that are involved in the construction and operation of pipelines. And, I, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent that this support letter from these four unions be entered into the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I support the this proposal from FEMSA, especially in light of several high-profile attacks on pipelines involving so-called valve turners, uh, these dangerous stunts uh, not only endanger lives, they damage property, they damage the environment, and can have significant economic consequences. Uh, to all our witnesses, do you agree that this activity is dangerous, uh, Ms. Sames? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lesniak? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mr. Black? Yes. Mr. Osman? Absolutely. Would uh, each of you support strengthening criminal standard to discourage people from damaging pipeline facilities? Ms. Sames? Yes. Mr. Lesniak? Uh, we'd need to look at the proposal. Okay. Mr. Black? Yes. Mr. Osmond? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Mr. Black, uh, Ms. Sames, and Mr. Osmond, uh, pipelines are among, we all know this, pipelines are among the safest and most efficient ways to deliver natural gas and petroleum projects, uh, products to the consumer. What are some of the significant trends across the industry to improve pipeline safety? If you can spend about 20 seconds each on what, what some of the significant trends are, uh, uh, trends are to improve safety today. When I look at the distribution incidents, the ones that cause death and injury, the leading two causes are excavation damage and vehicles hitting above ground pipelines. Those mm. are the top two. So there's a lot of effort to promote 811. Call before you dig, it's a free service. 
Uh, we need more people calling before they dig. On, on individuals hitting our lines um, with vehicles, we're, we're trying to figure out how do you stop people from going through a field and hitting a pipeline. I'm still struggling with that one. No, I understand, Mr. Black. So we're the safest method of transporting fuels, but we're not at the goal of zero incidents, and there we want to be. Uh, those trends are reviewed every year in our strategic plan. Uh, currently, we're very excited about two things. One, increase technology through <coughs> inspection devices, and two, improve safety culture through industry-wide implementation of safety management systems. Mr. Osman. In uh, the early 2000s, Congress directed PHMSA to implement an integrity management program. Uh, since that time, we've seen great improvement in the areas that that program was designed to address, threats like corrosion, threats like cracking on pipelines, and PHMSA is very close to completing a rulemaking to expand that to uh, a much wider degree of pipelines and also to implement newer technologies, so we're excited to see that happen. In the last minute that I have left, uh, Ms. Sames, as you know, 43 states and the District of Columbia have pipeline replacement programs as part of their statutes. In Texas, we have a risk-based program that requires operators to survey their pipelines for the greatest potential threats for failure and to make replacements. Our pipeline companies are required to develop a prioritized schedule for replacement, and in some ways, our Texas, regulation are more, Texas regulations are more stringent than PHMSA's. Generally speaking, how are these pipeline replacement programs funded, and what are some of the constraints to further accelerate the replacement of aging pipelines? So each operator is working closely with their state commission on replacement programs. They are proposing, here's what we want to replace, here's the timeline for replacement. It's all risk-based um, so that, and, and it tried to be done in a way at the least cost to the customers. Um, on faster, that's a bit of a challenge because you need qualified individuals in order to do the work. You do it too fast, you get, un I, I don't want that. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a good balance. Uh, there needs to be a balance between how quickly you replace with the qualified workforce so you have your quality. And going back to your last question, I apologize. None of us mentioned that the other thing that we're doing to advance is sharing of information. We do it through conferences, workshops, technical papers, so something else. Best practices you're talking about. That is correct. Okay. Thank you for all the witnesses for being here today, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Um, my understanding is that the 2011 pipeline safety bill included a number of required rulemakings uh, for PHMSA, many of which still are not completed eight years later. And I know that uh, Representative McNerney had asked the panel about the reasons for those delays. But Mr. Lesniak, um, I want to come back to you and ask you to more fully develop, if you would, PHMSA's cost-benefit requirements. Are they a, a, a hindrance to getting required rulemakings completed in a timely manner? And can you give us some more information in that regard? You know, as I said before, the Pipeline Safety Trust does think that that is one of the significant hindrances. There are other issues as, as well, but it's a duplicative process and um, and and unreasonably slows slows the process. And I think if if that part of it was eliminated, it would help move things along. And what areas of duplication are the of the most concerned? There's a OMB. There's a similar cost benefit analysis that's required by the OMB. And so why are we doing it two times? You know, we're not clear on that. Okay, I thank you for that. And what about NTSB itself? What about recommendations there are there still outstanding recommendations that haven't been implemented there there are there are uh, recommendations from NTSB that go way back many that are supported by the industry and that um, I, I think that NTSB recommendations um, because they're an independent uh, organization from the industry from FEMSA itself I think those those recommendations ought to be uh, taken seriously and prioritized for implementation and does the bill that we address here today with these hearings uh, help improve that in any way? It does, but it could go further. There are specific recommendations for uh, providing information to emergency responders that NTSB has recommended um, that are not included, and we think that those should be included. Okay. And uh, is leak detection technology an effective method to protect communities? It is, and it ought to be required with an effectiveness, uh, with a standard for the effectiveness of that leak detec detection technology. And so stronger requirements yes. for that detection system would be an improvement. Yes. For. Do any of our other 
witnesses have recommendations on NTSB's um, recommendations? Yes, Mr. Osman. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, we agree. Uh, NTSB's recommendations are important and should be given great consideration by FIMSA, by, by the industry, by all of us. Um, as we've said a few times, the pending rulemakings that we, we believe FIMSA will complete this year will close out uh, many outstanding FIMSA, uh, NTSB recommendations, and we think that's critical. Mr. Black, you had some primary, comments you wanted to share? The primary discussion we're having with the NTSB right now is they're encouraging operators of all different pipeline segments to implement safety management systems. We're doing a lot of workshops. We're encouraging pipeline operators to do that. The NTSB said the response <coughs> by the industry uh, exceeded expectations, and we're learning from them. Okay, thank you very much. And Ms. Sames? Yeah, and the only thing that I would add is with the NTSB recommendations, there, uh, I'm we're typically looking at what's the intent behind that particular recommendation. There are some recommendations that may not be practical in the real world. Um, and they'll, in the conversations with them, they'll say, you know, we're looking farther out. Where could technology be in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? Whereas the industry is looking at what can we do right now to meet the intent of what you want? So we are, I'm always looking at how can I meet what you want, but maybe in a more practical way. Okay, is there an example that you could, could share? Uh, sure. Uh, for example, the NTSB had a recommendation to make all pipelines piggable. And when I looked at it, I said, well, there's two options. You can either dig up a lot of pipelines and replace them, or you can create a new technology that will get through all the pipelines, because right now not all pipelines are piggable. You cannot run in an inline inspection in all pipelines because not because of lack of pressure, because of turns, because of valves. There's a lot of different criteria that don't make a certain pipeline pickable. But if we advance technology, we can get there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Representative Wahlberg for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, today's uh, hearing is, is very important. I think we all agree with that. And while I share some of the <laughs> concerns of my colleagues about process and policy in, in the uh, in the uh, discussion draft, I, uh, I am hopeful that we can find bipartisan consensus as we move forward. And we thank uh, the uh, panel for being here to help us in that process. Um, uh, Mr. Osman, uh, in your testimony, you emphasize the importance of direct assessment. Uh, it seems like we should be adding tools to FEMSA's toolbox, not taking them away. Uh, can you describe what they are, uh, these tools? and uh, when they are most appropriate for use. Sure, thank you. Um, direct assessment is an important safety technology in our toolbox. It involves um, looking for the precursors that might predict potential corrosion on a pipeline and going out and making excavations and actually looking at the pipe to understand if that's actually occurring. Um, it's a tool that we use when other types of assessment methods are not possible or not available. Uh, my colleague, Ms. Ames, just mentioned certain pipelines that can't accommodate internal inspection devices. That's one example of when we might uh, use that technology. And, you know, there's just always going to be certain areas of the pipe that can't use those internal inspection devices. Also, uh, sometimes there is a pipeline that cannot be shut down without having significant uh, impacts to the folks who rely on that natural gas. So we wouldn't want to use an assessment method like hydrostatic pressure testing that requires a pipeline shutdown. That's another example of a good opportunity to use a direct assessment. Okay. Uh, Mr. Black, uh, how does direct assessment compare to other assessment methods in terms of preventing future pipeline integrity issues uh, as opposed to finding existing problems? Well, for liquids, it's also an important tool in areas that cannot be pigged. Uh, examples, facility piping, where you still want to do that type of inspection, but you can't get inline inspection device there. So we would not support a provision to eliminate that important tool. It wouldn't help safety. Okay. Uh, Ms. Sames, are there situations where direct assessment of pipelines is more appropriate uh, than other methods when conducting pipeline integrity assessments? Direct assessment is a predictive model. Um, it's predicting where corrosion should be um, and where you have the potential for corrosion to occur in the future, whereas for inline inspection, it's what's, occur what's already occurred. So if you're an operator that wants to predict where corrosion could be occurring, you want direct assessment because it's helping you with those predictions. 
And you're also digging up the line when you're doing direct assessment to confirm what you're finding. Okay. Uh, moving uh, uh, on to switching gears here a little bit, uh, uh, Mr. Osman, um, in FIMS's draft proposal, uh, there was a placeholder for a voluntary information sharing program. Uh, this is something I'm very interested in and would like to get stakeholder feedback on. So do you think Congress should authorize such a program in our pipeline safety reauthorization, uh, this Congress? Yes, absolutely. It would go a long way to helping us share the information we need to improve our safety performance. Mr. Black? Yes, we'd agree. We'd encourage Congress to look at the report issued by a multi-stakeholder group that took years to work on this. Not everything in the administration proposal uh, included uh, what the report includes. Okay, Ms. Sames. Yes, it does, and the administration bill, as Mr. Black indicated, doesn't quite go far enough. Um, in my opinion, it, for example, it doesn't include distribution systems. Um, and so <laughs> representing the distribution industry, I, we've been pushing for, for that sharing of information to go f throughout the entire network. Um, also, make sure the protections are there so that individuals sharing the information know they're protected um, from voluntarily providing safety concerns, safety issues, their findings, very similar to the FAA, making sure that's in place. And then um, finally, um, incentives. Um, if, if I'm an operator and I'm concerned that not all the protections are there, I'm probably going to be hesitant to share information. So anything that can encourage the sharing of information, even if it's as simple as FIMSA saying, we're getting information from this particular operator, that would be good. Other areas, Mr. Black or Mr. Osmond, on this liability protection uh, that you would suggest? Well, we would encourage FIMSA and Congress to encourage FIMSA to uh, encourage voluntary self-reporting so that pipeline operators will identify, disclose, correct. Right now, they have that discretion, but they use it very infrequently, and it's not provided the incentive that it needs. That's an option to improve safety. Okay. Well, my time has expired, so I, I yield back. I want to thank uh, the gentleman for you and May. <clears throat> that concludes our panel, and I want to... I wanna Thank each and every one of you for joining us today and for uh, sharing your time and your thoughts, your insights with us. And we will continue to work with you as we proceed in the future. Thank you so very much. Uh, 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 there's a request for unanimous consent to enter into uh, the record and the following uh, test of, uh, letters and other documents uh, from uh, associated uh, uh, entities, uh, including a letter from the National Society of Professional Engineers, <clears throat> a letter from Aclara Technologies, LLC, a letter from the American Petroleum Institute, a letter from the GPA Midstream Association, a letter from the International Union of Operating Engineers, Labor's International Union of North America, the North uh, America's Trading, Building Trade Unions, and the United Association of Plumbers and Pipe Fitters. An analysis and draft proposal of the protecting our infrastructure of pipelines and enhancing safety act of 2019 from the pipeline and hazardous material safety um, administration, technical drafting assistance of the safer pipeline, pipelines act of 2019 from the pipeline and hazardous materials safety administration, and finally, a letter from the National Association, Association of Corrosion Engineers. Uh, and without objection, uh, these, uh, this is so ordered. Uh, I want to thank again the, the witnesses, and I remind the members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 
10 business days to submit additional questions for the record uh, to be answered by the witnesses who have, who have appeared, and I ask each witness to respond promptly to any such uh, questions that you may receive. Uh, seeing a consent from the witnesses, at this time, the subcommittee stands adjourned. I'm running over to the seat.